I'd like to introduce to you the Deputy Chief of Mission is basically the right-hand man or guy or gal to the ambassador and uh, uh, the second in command, if you will. And, um, and if any of you were at the IKEA opening yesterday, uh, you heard him express a commitment to sustainability and, and climate issues and, and demonstrate the leadership not just of IKEA, but of the country of Sweden. And, um, and that talk about a mission. That is a wonderful mission to promote. And he has been in various diplomatic and governmental positions for Sweden um, for many, many years. He's been in Copenhagen and um, Estonia and St. Petersburg, Russia. We are so delighted to have you here. And please welcome Gorn Mithal. Thank you, Kathy, for that wonderful introduction. I think you put it uh, correctly. My children have difficulties understanding what I actually do. I, I'm never the boss, obviously, so, but they, they like to call me the second in command because they have some friends working at the Ministry for Defense in DC. So, and I used to work at the, same, at the Ministry for Defense in Sweden as well, so I'm the second in command. Well, uh, we're not here to talk about me, but first of all, thank you so much for coming, all of you, today. It's really wonderful. Um, I'm still thrilled about yesterday's events, opening the new IKEA store and saw in the log, which was very well prepared, I would say. We only took us a few seconds. Um, but on behalf of the Swedish government and the embassy of Sweden in Washington, D.C., thank you so much for joining us here today. And thank you to the city of St. Louis uh, and to um, Cortex for host, co-hosting this event, and a special thanks to Catherine herself for, for your, all the time and the efforts that you've invested in, in today's program. When we learned at the embassy that IKEA, a sustainability leader, was opening its store here in St. Louis, we decided we wanted to join them to, to mark this wonderful location. Um, because we also wanted to, to provide by carry out discussions on an issue that is important to Sweden. We do have many important issues to choose from, but climate change is the top, one of the top priorities for our government. Um, this year is an eventful year when it comes to global change. Several important meetings have taken, taken or will take place this year. A week ago, a new post-2015 sustain, sustainable development goals were set in New York. And in December, we will have the negotiations in Paris, COP21. With our voice in action, Sweden hopes to contribute to a, a successful outcome for these processes. In the United States and in the rest of the world, we believe that subnational levels, cities, and businesses with different circumstances and abilities will play a significant role when it comes to uh, securing a sustainable future. Sustainability is today very important to Sweden, but hasn't always been. After hosting, hosting the first UN conference on human environment in 1972, Sweden started to make some tough decisions to improve our environment. Our Swedish experience is that it's, uh, it really is possible to combine sustain, sustainable and substantial economic growth and at the same time minimize our, uh, our ecological footprints. Between 1990 and 2012, Swedish greenhouse gas emissions have been cut by 20%. And during the same time, our economy has grown by 60%. We have succeeded in reducing our impact on the climate while increasing our economic performance and competitiveness. The Swedish government has set high ambitions to meet the climate change. Our long-time vision is that Sweden by 2050 will have no net emissions of greenhouse gases. Already today, Sweden benefits from having a highest share, the highest share of renewable energy in the EU, with over 50% of our energy coming from renewable energy sources. This has been achieved through combining long-term goals and long-term economic in incentives. Uh, as one of the first countries uh, in the world, we introduced the CO2 tax in the early 1990s. Together with other measures, such as ambitious targets for energy efficiency and renewable energy, we have been able to increase our energy efficiency, lower our carbon emissions, increase renewable energy, and create growth and jobs at the same time. The demand for innovations and technologies with minimal environmental impact is on the increase in both Sweden and the rest of the world. 
Between 2003 and 2011, the total rise for exports for the Swedish environmental sector was 69%. While the rise for the total Swedish export was 58%. The environmental sector is growing faster than the average. The overarching uh, environmental goal for Sweden says that uh, we, to the next generation, will hand over a society where environmental problems are solved without causing increased environmental and health problems outside of Sweden. This requires action in Sweden and together with other countries. Coordinated international efforts and cooperation will not only de decrease emissions, but uh, can also spur investments in low carbon technologies, energy production and infrastructure and improve economic performance around the world. At COP21 in Paris, we, we hopefully will agree uh, on a global, fair and legally binding climate agreement that over time contributes to keep global warming as uh, far below the two, two degrees as possible. The agreement should place demands on countries and create necessary conditions for other actors to take responsibility when it comes to climate change and to take increasingly more ambitious actions to reduce emissions and contribute to greater resilience against the effects of climate change. Important actions will have to come from the business sector. Both big and small companies have to contribute. On that note, I'm eager to listen to Professor Raven uh, and the speakers from IKEA, Nestle Purina, and Thea Kotron, and their discussions moderated by Professor Hall. Where are you sitting, Mr. Hall? <laughs> oh, yeah, that's true. Um, and we will listen to the efforts and thoughts about the urgent issue of climate change and uh, how they all can contribute. Thank you so much. Next special treat that we have is to hear from somebody who has been described by Time Magazine as a hero for the planet. Dr. Peter Raven uh, is frankly a legend in his own time. And so uh, we have a luminary beyond luminaries. It is my great pleasure to welcome Dr. Peter Raven. It seems remarkable that the IPCC was formed in 1988 and that George Bush, President 41, President of the United States, was one of the main people who cooperated in its formation because he wanted an accurate assessment of global warming, and that the IPCC, which consists of about 1,200 uh, scientists working together, the best people in the field, work in committees, have the best reviews they can possibly get, and then the reports are signed off on by, uh, by about 100 countries that are signatories to the IPCC, and yet, here we are, uh, 27 years later, with idiots who know absolutely nothing about science saying that that is a conspiracy. I never, uh, <laughs> I never met any two scientists who would really engage in a conspiracy, uh, who wouldn't be fighting with one another. So I doubt very much if the 1,200 who are in there could be engaged in a conspiracy given the nature of science, which apparently is something we have a very hard time in understanding. Um, I want to say how delighted I am that this has been formed by Catherine, that this meeting has been formed at the request of the Swedish Embassy how delighted all of us in St. Louis are that IKEA has opened a store here and with their policies and the policies of Sweden and how much I would congratulate Catherine Werner for her tireless efforts and the mayor, with the mayor's full support in the city of St. Louis to basically get real. Uh, <laughs> It seems uniquely appropriate that Sven Arrhenius, a Swedish Nobel Prize winner in the 1890s, declared that if we kept on increasing the concentration of gases in the atmosphere, that we would inevitably be bringing about a warming of the Earth's basic temperature. Uh, that was in the 1890s. Hello, it's uh, 130 years <laughs> later now. And in fact, it's impossible to imagine any physical principle which would uh, increase the concentration of heat-trapping gases in the atmosphere without warming the uh, climate of the planet concerned. Carl Sagan always used to say or point out that the 
planets that have a thick atmosphere with many uh, gases in it are much warmer, sometimes like Venus, 2,000 or 3,000 degrees. Those that have no atmosphere are very cold, and hello again, why or how can anybody ever waste any of our time and especially precious opportunities to do something about this? Uh, to set the stage very briefly for uh, what follows, I'll simply point out that the invention of agriculture about uh, 10,000 years ago when it became a normal source of food for people, that the development of agriculture by the human race after 2.3 million years or 2.5 million years of history of human beings on Earth, 10,000 years ago when agriculture was first developed, uh, there were about 1 million people on the entire planet Earth, about 100,000 in Europe. And since then, the progression has been inexorable with uh, towns, uh, cities, states founded, and with the development of everything that we hold precious in civilization. World population growth for the past 1,500 years, for the past 500 years, looks like this. And uh, as you can see, this all being from a base of 1 million people 10,000 years ago, we have a completely unprecedented situation now and one that demands our urgent attention. <laughs> Those who say that population is no problem or, and that we'll, we've solved problems before and that we'll easily be able to solve them now are misleading us in a most serious and damaging way because there's absolutely nothing paralleling the situation that we have now at any point in the past. Our human domination of the global ecosystem and of the productive uh, elements on which we depend is so absolute that we, abs we must pay attention. Remember that about not 800 million of this 7.3 billion people are malnourished in the sense that their minds and bodies did not develop properly that about 100 million are on the verge of starvation at any one time, and that we're adding 220,000 babies net every day if you want a sobering view of the world for the future. That illustrates why paying attention to global warming as one of the major factors, and I'll talk about that briefly in a minute, as one of the major factors to which we must pay the greatest attention is a matter of good business. It's a matter of extreme urgency if we have any interest at all in preserving the civilization that we all enjoy and that's been developed over the last 10,000 years. It may seem that population is the only problem that's important, but in fact, population is multiplied by consumption and by technology, technologies that seemed very suitable at the start of the Industrial Revolution 200 years ago are now proving to be highly consequential in a negative way for our future. There are three time, there are three people on Earth for every one person who was here when I was born. And that sort of frightens me and means that we really do have a situation that does demand our attention. As a vignette of consumption, this is one week of food for a Western family of four. That's how much they use to support themselves and how much we all aspire to in industrialized countries. And here's one week of food for a family of five in Western Africa. It doesn't take any very great imagination to understand that the impact, that our impact, the impact of people in Western Europe, the United States, and Japan is much greater than the impact of people in Western Africa. And then there's air pollution. Jack Benny used to say, Los Angeles, where you wake up to the coughing of the birds. <laughs> but, and of course, David Letterman said, my favorite season of the year in Los Angeles is autumn when the birds change colors and fall out of the trees. <laughs> But it's no joking matter, as people in China are finding out very rapidly, their uh, 
poisonous atmosphere which is wrecking their development of industrial and economic centers everywhere is a serious matter of concern for every single person in China and very difficult to do anything about it. Our emission of greenhouse gases in the United States and Western Europe is much higher per capita than the emission in China, but with 1.3 billion people there, their overall emission has now become the largest in the world. I strongly recommend that you all consult the website footprintnetwork.org, footprintnetwork.org, on which I'll depend for the next couple of images. Footprintnetwork.org, a think tank headed by Mathis Wackernagel, which is in Oakland, California, compares biocapacity, the bioproductive area available to us, uh, with ecological footprint, how much bioproductive area do we demand? And that's very much along the lines of the natural step and earlier excellent uh, uh, development of this sort that, that, that actually was originated in Sweden with the patronage of the King of Sweden around 25 years ago. Ecological footprint is made up of many things which you can see in this image. Uh, there are many ways in which we affect the world and draw on the world. But the summary, the thing that I want to call, to which I want to call your attention is that according to the calculations of uh, the uh, Global Footprint Network, footprintnetwork.org, we were using 70% of all biocapacity worldwide in 1970, and we're now using 156%, which means that with 800 million malnourished people in a population of 7.3 billion growing by 220,000 a day, uh, we are using the capacity of one and a half copies of the planet Earth on an ongoing basis. This in turn means that by mid-August of every year, we've exhausted what is available for us and are cutting into the principle, the productive capacity of the world that supports us. Uh, that is uh, awful, especially when you, when you can calculate that if you added 50% more planet Earth, you would be not cutting into the sustainable capacity of the world, but you would still have 800 uh, million malnourished people and 100 million on the verge of starvation. It's simply that you would then be sustainable. Uh, we need 50% more productivity than exists, but even if we had it, we wouldn't be any better off. Footprint, Global Footprint Network in 1961 showed those countries which had greater biocapacity in darker shades of green and those which were drawing from other countries in the world in, uh, in brownish, uh, d deeper shades of brown. Uh, but look where it is in 2005. Uh, now China, India, most of the countries in Western Europe, North Africa, the United States, Mexico, are all drawing in more than they can produce to support their civilization. That means in the United States we depend on countries, or Sweden, we depend on, Sweden is still within its capacity, but uh, the United States and many other countries draw on far more than they can produce. So when you read about China buying agricultural land or renting agricultural land all over the world, understand that there are limits to that and that uh, Gro Harlem Brundtland's uh, Common Future Report of, 19, of the late 1980s with its uh, sort of now, I would say, Pollyanna image of all the countries in the world coming up by hard work and, and intelligence and international uh, attention to the same level is something which is physically impossible. This is Keeling's curve of carbon dioxide on Mauna Loa, one of the five volcanoes that make up the island of Hawaii. And as you can see, uh, carbon dioxide has been rising continuously. We focus on carbon dioxide even though it's only one of 16 greenhouse gases and we're always facing the possibility of the emission of great amounts of methane, a much more serious greenhouse gas, for example, by the depletion of the Arctic. 
as a result of that rise in greenhouse gases, these are predictions for the future. The United Nations is talking about in COP uh, meeting in Paris in December, holding it under two degrees Celsius by decades from now, but very few scientists who have made these calculations think we can hold it under three degrees Celsius. And many have calculated that at three or four degrees Celsius, the changes in the Earth are absolutely impossible to withstand in terms of their horrible effects. And even at two degrees Celsius, the disruption of agriculture, the, the greater increase of major storms and all the rest becomes impossible. You can hear all the figures in the world, but if you experience global warming yourself, you have a better way of, uh, you have a better appreciation for it, a gripping appreciation for it, and perhaps a moral appreciation, which is what Pope Francis is going for. Uh, because the effects of global warming are met uh, unequally by the poor, many people in industrialized countries feel that we have a moral obligation to attend to them. And both Roman Catholics and evangelical Christians in the United States feel that that itself is a serious problem, that we must attend to global warming because it's not legitimate to affect and penalize the poor worldwide. This is a group of scientists, uh, which uh, Pat and I were members, and evangelical Christians that went to the Arctic seven years ago to see the effects of global warming firsthand. And on the island of Shishmaref in the Arctic Ocean, we found the uh, uh, permafrost melting in the streets of this community of about 6, peop 600 people, excuse me, dropping one by one off the edge of the cliff. Glaciers uh, shrinking rapidly, trees dying as a result of the changing climate and the advantage that that gave to their pests, and of course, many severe effects tied to global warming in, in uh, global climate change in, in better or worse demonstrated ways, but as there are more demonstrations, the connection always seems to be clearer. Sea level rise, of course, uh, it's uh, uh, amazing that some political bodies and some of our so-called leaders pretend that there's no effect of global warming when this is simply a map of sea level rise since the 1850, 1880 rather, to the present, and that the red line at the end is by satellite. Uh, there is no getting away from sea level rise, and of course people, again, don't come to grips very well with the idea that uh, if all the ice on land, glaciers and polar ice caps were to melt, sea level would rise about 80 meters, <coughs> which is not acceptable and means that we've got to get on with this, but because of the huge lag effect in this, we've got to get on with it now we haven't got the opportunity to wait around. We haven't got the opportunity really to wait 10, 20, 30 years, even if we think those are good conclusions from the COP meeting, uh, because uh, the it's upon us now. China has already calculated that 30% of its three coastal industrial areas will be lost to sea level rise and is taking steps to replace them. Vietnam, one of the few rice exporters in the world, has calculated that about a third of its rice-producing land will be submerged, and so it goes. Um, at when the sea level rises, you get maps of the world like this, and uh, they are truly frightening. We have a wonderful world, a biological world, into which we all evolved, and that world supports us in every way. We're completely dependent on it, and we must protect it. Our rapid population growth, our even greater and more rapid desire for increased consumption, and our use of adverse technologies are literally destroying the productive capacity of the world in which we live. Figures don't necessarily convince people fast enough that we need to take action because they seem dull in background and we all have got to get on with our daily activities uh, and therefore we kind of put them aside. Moral commitment, on the other hand, is something much more serious. 
In 1970, at Earth Day, 20 million people turned out in the United States, and there was a worldwide environmental movement. 20 million people in 1970 was 10% uh, of the population of the United States, which was then about 200 million. And of course, that convinced politicians very well that there was a serious need to do something about it without which demonstration they really can do nothing. President Nixon in the next few years signed into law the uh, key environmental legislation that governs our activities in the United States and various people have been trying to destroy it ever since. If we can demonstrate the kind of moral commitment that is needed to get something done, and make it clear to our leaders that it's something that we need and we desire, then they will respond. If we don't demonstrate that, they will find other priorities. Uh, this group, in thinking about the, in the better and improved functioning of cities and the improved functioning of built structures and all the rest with Sweden and IKEA right here in St. Louis being leaders in that and our mayor's office deeply committed to the same problem are set to do something about this. It would be almost uh, insane to run a business and not assume that the effects of global warming would be going to affect you in the relatively near future or even that they're not affecting you now. Any business that acts as if it's really not happening or chooses to bury its head in the sand while it gets on with uh, business as usual is almost certainly destined to fail over the next decades. It will affect in various ways every single corporate activity in the world and corporations that are intelligent uh, like IKEA and like the ones represented here today will pay attention to it We'll adapt to it and we'll take steps to mitigate it and also take steps to try to affect our political leadership to deal with it. It's for the reason that we need moral leadership that a number of us uh, in the Pontifical Academy of Sciences encourage the, encourage the Pope and the Vatican to begin providing the kind of moral leadership that Pope Francis with his unique brand of charisma and conviction is able to deliver. I hope that all of us in this room will continue to play our part because there is no problem facing the human race that's more serious for us to deal with right now if we want in any way to have civilization as we know it to continue for another 50 years in anything like its present form. Thank you very much. It's been a pleasure to address you.